I, I was on a mission, as Karate has taught me, you know, set your goals, set, your, set the bar high, and give it your best shot. What's up, everybody? It's episode 64 of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Hanchi Richard Bernard. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, the founder here at Whistle Kick, but most listeners know me better as the show's host. Whistle Kick, if you don't know, makes the world's best sparring gear as well as great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of the traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome all of our new listeners and thank you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we make, like our polyester t-shirts. They're great under your uniform to soak up the sweat, and they're even a bit lighter weight than the polyester shirts you might be used to from some other companies. Available in a bunch of different colors and sizes, you can take a look at our polyester shirts and all the rest of the stuff we make over at whistlekick.com. If you want to check out some of our other podcast episodes or see the show notes, those are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We've added a new feature to today's show notes, a quiz. Head on over, take the quiz, see how you stack up to others on the leaderboard, and please give us your feedback. We're always looking for ways to help you enjoy the show more, and who knows, if the quizzes take off, we may even start offering prizes. We'll see. But here we are for episode 64, and we're joined by Hanchi Richard Bernard. If you've heard Hanchi Ron Martin's episode, you've heard Hanchi Bernard's name before. And now it's time for us to really find out what makes him tick. We spent time talking about things and in different ways than I would have expected. I knew Hanchi a bit before we started the episode, but I learned a tremendous amount during our time. I'm honored to call him a friend, and I think you'll see why as you listen. So here we go. Hanchi Bernard, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me, Jeremy. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. So, um, anyone that follows Whistle Kick closely will recognize your name as frequent victor to our push-up contest yeah. that we ran over the last eighteen months. Of course, that's really how I got to know you was was through that. But here we're going to have the opportunity. I'm going to have the opportunity to get to know you a lot better, and I'm looking forward to that. So, why don't we start the way we always start? How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, it was back in the, I was, I'm an only child and growing up, I was uh, severely introverted, severely. I missed out on a lot of opportunities and I had heard that this martial arts stuff was good to develop confidence and I didn't have any and I wanted to be viewed as a tough guy of sorts. Uh, for all the wrong reasons, and uh, so I, uh, I ventured into a school when I was in the late teens, and uh, very, uh, very spot in conditions. And after they taught me a couple of techniques, I was asked to break a two by four that was suspended over two metal folding chairs, and I just came shot of breaking my hand that night, and that was the end of that school. I still had this ambition to proceed. So I ventured into another school, and after teaching me a few techniques, uh, they didn't have the, the best training implements. They had actually flypaper strips hanging from the ceiling, and I was supposed to punch at this strip, not touch it, of course, and, uh, you know, throw my Sikenzuke, my basic strike shot, and that would show control. And of course, I touched it and I had all this goo all over my hand and that was the end of that school. I left humiliated and uh, I kind of put it out of my mind for a little bit. And then I saw an ad in the, the local paper, uh, it just said karate lessons, call Richie. So um, I called Richie and uh, the phone rang for quite a while, and part of me did not want him to pick it up because I didn't have the confidence. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to ask. So he finally picked it up and totally unprofessionally said, yeah. I said, yeah, is this Richie? Uh, you teach karate? Uh, karate. And uh, he said, yeah. Okay, you know, what do you need? And my first question was, how long will it take me to make black belt? <laughs> 
And uh, <laughs> he said, are you in some sort of rush? <laughs> so anyway, I, I rec- recruited a friend and we started training in this Richie's basement, uh, Gojuru Karate. And uh, it was over in Beacon Projects in Lawrence, Mass. Kind of kind of a, a, a tough section, but uh, we, we were hanging in there. And the classes, you know, it was just a few of us in class and it was old school conditions, you know, you'd throw up, you'd get back on the floor and train. And I was hanging in probably because of my friend helping me as a crutch. But um, then I was, Richie lived at, at this location and he started coming home uh, a little late for class. It was obvious he maybe had a beer or two and classes got more rigorous and sort of brutal. And I still hanging in there. And then Richie stopped coming home. So I said, that's it. Strike three. I'm out. I gave it my best shot. It's not meant to be. And that, that was it. Well, my friend that I had recruited had a friend that happened to be taking Gojuru Karate at the Lawrence YMCA with this gentleman named Ron Martin. And knowing what I know now, I would have known that, okay, I studied Goju and right across town is another Goju school. There must have been some sort of fracture between these two individuals, but I, I didn't put two and two together back then. So I said, no, I'm, I'm done. I, I, I appreciate your interest, but I just, I'm done. So my friend said, well, you know, let's get down to Lawrence Y and shoot some pool. I said, that, that's fine. So we go into the Y and I go to the right to head towards the pool tables. And he said, we can't go that way tonight. I said, why not? He said, well, the scuba divers have all, all of their gear laid out and regulators. And I said, that was kind of a common thing down there. So I said, all right. So we walk through the bowels of the basement. And when we come out into the wrestling room and there's a karate class in progress. So basically I was set up to get to that location that night. He <laughs> lied to me to get me there. Yeah. And his friend came over and welcomed us. So I said, all right. I, I was kind of mad. And uh, he said, let me, let me take you into the uh, locker room and introduce you to my, my teacher, Mr. Martin. So we go on, <laughs> excuse me, we go into the locker room and Mr. Martin is standing in front of locker number five, putting on his protective cup. <laughs> and I'm introduced as someone who is trained across town with this Richie character and that I took Goju Karate. And like I said, I didn't, I was not aware of the fact that These two instructors had a major falling out. So Mr. Martin's first words to me were, that doesn't mean bleep, bleep, bleep around here, dude. I said, okay. So he says, uh, you know, do you have a gi? I I said, yes. He said, well, put it on. I said, well, I didn't bring it with me. He said, well, why didn't you bring it with you? I said, I didn't know I was going to a dojo. He said, well, where the hell did you think you were going? <laughs> this was going down <laughs> south fast. <laughs> so he, he grabbed it. You know, back then, there were geese hanging around everywhere, filthy rotten. And he said, hey, grab, put this one on and come on out on a dojo. Uh, I couldn't wait to get out of this place. And uh, so he assigned me this instructor. His name was Rick Savastano. Well, Rick was a very nurturing, compassionate, every- <laughs> Everything I needed at that point. <laughs> Excuse me. So he uh, he took me through the technique that I had, and he went over and you know chat with Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin come, came back. He said, "All right, this is the deal." He said, "You want to train with us? We'll start you out at QQ level." And uh, I knew right away that was my a rank. You know, it was a little green stripe on a white belt, and uh, I never heard another word he said. I was hooked right then and there. Boom, I'm in. And that was the beginning. By Lawrence YMCA uh, and the Ron Martin. Wow. So, you know, I've got a pretty good picture. And of course, you know, anyone that's listened to the show for a little bit knows that I had the chance to talk to Hanshi Martin not too long ago. And he's a, a pretty big personality. So I can imagine myself in the room as you at that time. But, you know, I can only imagine what it was like for you you know, completely getting snowballed into where you were going. And, you know, here you've had a few different strikes with the martial arts, people not treating you very well. What was it at that moment in front of him that you didn't just say, no, thank you, and walk away? Well, 
you know, up in front of the dojo, it was pretty clear what was required. It was a big sign that said, show up, shut up, and line up. So I kind of knew where I stood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was that, the assignment of that other instructor, Mr. Savastano, he was my crutch. And the fact that I was being recognized for my first rank night one for, you know, duty already served at that other basement dojo, uh, I don't know, it's just something that, and he did, he didn't, you know, he treated everyone kind of a spot in condition. <laughs> uh, a white belt was almost, uh, no, nah, now we got to slow the whole class down to teach this white belt. It, it's just not the most, but all schools were like that back then. So it was, uh, you know, kind of a take it or leave it thing. There weren't schools in every corner like there are today. And I don't know, there was just something that was karma, destiny, <laughs> something Something kept me there, and I never looked back at, from that point. Yeah, that's great. So now this was around the time, um, maybe a little bit before. I'm, I'm doing math, and I, I'm not going to put you on the spot. But was this before or kind of in the middle of Hanshi Martin's um, successes on the competitive circuit? This was way before. Okay. Um, I was there. <laughs> when Mr. Martin was discovered by Mr. Merriman. And that's what transformed uh, the dojo into a, well, Mr. Martin particularly, into a mega superpower, mega. It was Mr. Merriman that he basically saw a diamond in the rough. So I started with Mr. Martin just you know, a little bit prior to Mr. Merriman coming on the scene. And I saw that transformation of the dojo from good into, you know, just off the charts good. Um, so Mr. Merriman was also a very integral part of my upbringing and the influence he, he had with my teacher and the transformation of the dojo. Uh, just something to behold. I was on the front lines. Saw it all. Uh, you, were, you, were through, you were there through all, all the big moments, I'm sure. I was there through all the big moments, yeah. Uh, we were doing one particular form of Goju, and then when Mr. Merriman came on board, we transitioned over. You know, it goes back so many years. I forget if it was Okinawan, and we went to Japanese, or vice versa. Um, but there were some changes to be made, and I just I had <laughs> faith in my teacher, and I trusted him, and I just went for the ride. And and the rest is history, so to speak. Yeah, great history, great history. And from that history, we've had some some fun stories that not only have come from Mr. Martin, but you know some of the other people that those stories have trickled out to onto the show. But you know, you've listened to the show, and fans of the show know that we're all about the stories. <laughs> so I know you've got a ton. I've I've heard you tell some from time to time, but if you would indulge me and tell us your best martial arts story. Well, it's in, indirectly martial arts related. I, I get a lot of wash stories. Uh, um, I was a floor manager or a bouncer, whatever you want to call it, and basically a Hells Angels biker bar. But this story has to do with the, the other end of the spectrum. I went part of my my past life included I was a police officer in the town of Bedford, New Hampshire. And uh, I basically was working part-time, but I was putting in so many hours part-time, they asked me if I would like to come on full-time and, you know, get the benefits of that. And at the time, I was 42 years old. So it meant I'd have to go to the police academy for, at the time, it was a 10-week academy. So... Yeah, uh, then 42 years old, everyone else up there is going to be 20 to 25 for the most part. So we sent up another 42-year-old from Bedford and a former Marine, which I have the highest respect for. And I asked him, I said, you know, are you getting ready for this academy? Uh, he said, nah, I went to Paris Island. I, he said, I'll, I'll be able to deal with it, no problem. I said, yeah, but that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he went up. And he washed out the first day. And so now I'm going up to the next academy. And it's in alphabetical order. So last name, Bernardo, up near the front of the line. We don't have any uniforms or, on any, or anything at this point. So they, they basically said, uh, you know, who are you and where are you from? I said, um, you know, 
Rich Bernard from Bedford, New Hampshire. Bedford, New Hampshire. What are they recruiting from the senior citizen home out there? So I saw them. I saw the, the lieutenant and the sergeant. They were taking a pool on what time that first day I would wash out. They were passing dollars amongst each other. And when I saw that, I said, okay, that's just what I need. Throw a little gas on my fire. So uh, the lieutenant said, what do you think about that, Bernard? I said, I don't think you should take that bet, sir. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> academy proceeded, and I was number one ranking every week. Uh, it ended up, I come out of that number one ranking, but the sixth week was my, my shining time. Uh, we are in class, and uh, other departments were sending uh, some regulars there to attend these particular classes. So there were police chiefs, there were state police, there were fish and game, there were deputy sheriffs. And then it was this classroom of probably 46 remaining recruits. And the lieutenant, he was a black belt in Taekwondo. And he was kind of encouraging us to continue our physical training after we graduate. And like in his case, he took martial arts. And then he said, does anyone else take martial arts? So no one wants to answer, you know. <laughs> so he says, uh, on a code violation means if you do not answer truthfully, they will bounce you. And I already saw a couple booted. So I said, <laughs> so three of us put up our hands and guy in the first, I was up in the back row because of the alphabetical. First guy says, well, I'm a green belt in Kempo. He said, well, I can, you know, keep it up, keep it up, keep training. And then um, another guy says, what are you? I'm a, I'm a brown belt in Taekwondo. Oh, okay. And he looks up and the, the lighting is a little bit uh, dim up at the back of the room. So he kind of squints and he says, hey, grandpa, <laughs> what are you? I said, at the time, I said, I'm a godan in karate do. He said, what? He said, speak English. I said, I'm a fifth degree black belt in Japanese karate. And at that point, he stopped teaching. He turned <coughs> and he bowed to me. I said, ah, oh. I get emotional when I talk about this. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he apologized for not knowing. He said, I should have known. I apologize, sir. And from that point out, I cruised through that academy because I was, I had made, you know, it was, it should have, it was obvious to him who had training and he missed it. He said, oh, I should have known, you know, 42 years old, finishing the first of the pack. What makes this guy tick? And that was my day in the sun right there. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's something that any of us that have trained for a long time, you know, you can you can pick it out. You can see in the personality. There's something in that, in the way that we approach things, that perseverance or whatever you want to call it. So, so were you saying that you cruised through because he realized that he wasn't going to break you, or right <laughs> at that point okay. he, he knew? Well, you know, they're looking for the weak links. Should there be any? Because they don't want to put these guys out on the street and endanger themselves as well as the, you know their fellow officers and the general public. So by me finishing first every week, I finished first academically at the end of the academy. I got an award and town of Bedford gave me an award. And, um, but they started out, I'd, they, they did a lot of running and a lot of push-ups. <laughs> I actually set a record up there for push-ups. Uh, and the running, you know, I started at the back of the pack, but then they were moving me up to the front with a couple of recruits. They just got out of the Marines. They were in phenomenal shape. So I was kind of at the, up at the front of the pack with the on the run so I'd, I'd already proven myself and I knew that you know I had what it took to be an officer and so they kind of uh, zeroed in on a few of the others that were mm, questionable yet um, so basically I had nothing left to prove at that point I just continued to do what I had been doing and uh, uh, I, I finished first academically and that was my goal when I went in I just didn't want to get through the academy. You know, on weekends when I came home, a lot of the guys went and yeah, maybe pottied a little bit. And I studied all weekend, all weekend long. I studied for the test that was going to be coming on Monday morning. And uh, yeah, I, I, I maintained my number one ranking for all, all 10 weeks. 
I'm not sure that was ever done before up to that point. I, I just don't know. But I, I was on a mission. As karate has taught me, you know, set your goals, set your, set the bar high, and give it your best shot. And uh, that I did. Yeah. So how would you compare the academy to maybe a, a black belt test? You know, there's probably more people listening to this right now that have been through some kind of strenuous black belt testing than have been through the police academy. Yeah, um, the academy, they, they had, um, you know, you'd get up whatever time of day, it was relatively early, and you'd do your uh, physical training, uh, you know, just a lot of calisthenics and uh, running, a lot of running, and uh, it, it was demanding, and they kept raising the bar, but anyone who... Um, you know, trained pretty regularly in martial arts. It was really none of those morning sessions were anywhere near a full-blown karate class. So it was a, can't say a walk in a park by any means, but I had done a lot more strenuous things up to that point in my life than those morning sessions. You just had to be careful not to get injured due to, you know, pushing yourself too hard because if you got injured, it meant you might get recycled, which no one wanted that. You know, whatever week you were at, would kind of you'd have to start from the beginning. So uh, I was a little bit more cognizant of uh, if I felt a little muscle ache or what have you, I, I tried to tend to it immediately. Um, but other than that, no, martial arts training was... Uh, now, that, that was that academy at that time. Uh, there's a lot of different police academies. Uh, my my stepson, who's a a uh, Mass State Trooper with the uh, the gang unit, he went to the Massachusetts State Police Academy, and that was a whole different breed of cat than the academy I went to. They had it was 26 weeks of paramilitary training from day one to minute last. Um, so I'm not sure I would have if I could have endured that one at the age of 42. But um, I just kept putting one foot in front of the other and hoping Friday would get there as soon as possible so he could go home, recoup, rest, and get back Monday morning to do it all again. Yeah, one foot in front of the other. I think that's that's the way a lot of us have learned to handle a lot of difficult things. I mean, it's actually, that's one of my personal mantras on a, a difficult day. Just take it one hour at a time, and if that's too much, it's a minute. Yep. Take a minute, minute at a time, whatever you've got to do to keep making that forward progress. Now, you mentioned that when you were younger, you were really kind of closed off from the world, only child, which is something I, I can certainly relate to. But yeah, I was, uh, go ahead, excuse me, Jerry. Right. Well, it, a lot of the guests that we've had on the show that have been in that boat, it was their parents driving them to take martial arts. But this was something that you were seeking out yourself. Right, right. So that's a little bit different than what we're used to. What... You know, you, did you – you wanted to have more confidence? You wanted to be a little bit more open to the world? Back in the early days, if, if you know, there weren't that many around. If you heard, you know, so-and-so was a black belt, it was almost like a god. <laughs> I just – probably for the wrong reasons, I wanted people to look at me with that type of respect because I was so introverted. I had no – you know, my self-respect, I really hadn't developed the self-awareness. I knew I was introverted and no confidence. Um, I ended up going to an all-boys high school, so that kind of shuttered my social skills a little more. And uh, I don't know, it's just something driving me that uh, when someone mentioned, oh, that, that guy over there is a, uh, a black belt, it just uh, something, something happened in my head. I said, wow. You know, it was just like a, a godlike figure for whatever reason back then. It was a scarcity back then. You know, there, there weren't that many around. And it, sure. it was just something I say, wow, if I, you know, if I had that, if people looked at me in that way, uh, that would certainly bolster my confidence. I, I didn't know how to connect all the dots. It was just uh, something that drove me. Um, it's hard to explain. It's just, and then, you know, that's, 
further fueled by, you know, a little way down the road after get going, the movie Billy Jack came out and then the series Kung Fu every week. And that just really, that just really pushed me forward at that point. I'd already started, but that gave me afterburners. Yeah. Billy Jack. I mean, there's a classic. And I think you're only the, the second guest to mention that movie on the show, which is kind of funny to me because it, it goes back so far, uh, farther even than if I'm doing the math right, if I'm remembering correctly, that was before Bruce Lee's big American movies. I believe so. Yeah, Billy Jack came out uh, 1971-ish, and Kung Fu 1972-ish, somewhere around there. Some, something like that, yeah. And I can remember when it came out, you know, you have so many people in the dojo, and after that movie came out, uh, I was in Mr. Martin's dojo, and there was a lot of commotion outside. Uh, you know, we're on a main street, a lot of traffic, but there was more traffic. And I look out into the parking lot, and all these cars were pulling in. Prospective students that had seen that movie. It, it, it just, it, that was the explosion of martial arts in this country, from what I can remember. Yeah. It was, uh, Overnight, it was overnight, and then when Kung Fu came out, it was a weekly more fuel on the fire. You know, it, and everyone waiting for the flashbacks to the temple. It was just a, an amazing time, right? An amazing time. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back and let's imagine that, you know, you as this late teenage years introverted child didn't end up finding Mr. Martin. You know, that you, you had those couple attempts at martial arts training and right. they didn't work out and, and you didn't end up going. You know, maybe you went and played pool that night and that was that was it. You know, here's our transition. Yep. What do you think your life would have looked like without your karate training? When I first thought about that question, I would say, well, I would, you know, uh, have remained full time police officer, but. Martial arts is what opened the door for me to get into police work. So I'd have to go back a, another generation of my early employment. I was uh, an insurance adjuster, auto appraiser, fire insurance adjuster. And it, it was, you know, good, a very good job, uh, good pay. I drove a brand new Corvette every year. Uh, so I'd probably still, I probably would have retired from that at this point. But basically, I, it was just to me, it was a kind of a mundane existence. Uh, I was bored to death doing it, although I was good at it. I was just bored to death, so it would be like, you know, a nine-to-five job, come home, kick back, watch TV. Uh, it just wouldn't have the excitement that my life has had, for sure. That That's probably the the what the rut I would have remained in for the duration of the employment anyway. Sort of a... Uh... Maybe, I'm going to put some words out there, maybe a little less than fulfilling than what your yeah, life you've been transitioned in, you've into. You've been in one burnt out building, you've been in it all. And sure, that is helping people. But back then, you know, you had to hand write all of, out all the claims, nothing like today on computers. So it was, it was very strenuous uh, as far as it was boring. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to sh sift through all the rubble and it just. And then. <clears throat> Because, <laughs> because I was a martial artist, I miraculously, I had some beautiful uh, seacoast towns that were my territory, you know, like Gloucester and Rockport down in this area, and it's just gorgeous. So that, that in itself made it, uh, you know, it, it was interesting. But then I, I was given Lawrence, Lowell, and Haverhill, which, uh, they're beautiful cities, but they've got some serious problems, you know, heroin. And I, I, I picked up those territories because my, my boss was actually out on a claim and he got mugged and he got hit across the front of the face with a baseball bat, knocked out all of his teeth. And because I was a martial artist, I found this out after the, after I thought I was getting a promotion, you know, I'm moving up into the bigger league. I'm getting the cities now. Had nothing to do with that. They they envisioned someone who might be able to protect himself if that were to reoccur again, and so uh, it just got old real quick at that point. I remember yeah. I drove a brand I drove a brand new Corvette, so I'm going into a very very depressed portion of town. 
parking the wheels there and going into a burnt out building and uh, <laughs> uh, disaster was lurking. There's no doubt yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. So I just, well, uh, it, 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 it started getting old real quick. <laughs> I can only I always, imagine. I, I always had the desire to teach martial arts full time professionally, and I just didn't know how to get there. Uh, you know, I was teaching when I was an insurance adjuster. I was teaching part time evenings, but I had that desire. And uh, yeah, my my boss called me in one day. He said, "You know, we're a little bit slow." He said, "So um, what I want you to do is see your claims in the morning." kind of wine and dining insurance agents in the afternoon to try to pull some claims out of them and then write up your claims at night. So I can't do that. I, I teach karate at night. He said, well, I guess you have to make a decision. I, I don't know where the words came from. I said, well, I guess you just made it for me. I'll give you my two weeks notice. And that's the end of it. I only had about 30 students. <laughs> After I left there, you know, at the time I was married and I got to go home and tell my wife that I just quit my job. But prior to that, I had sat down with my accountant and I, I said, you know, in order to do this full-time professionally, if I, if I have to live in a tent on the beach, how many students do I need? And it was like, uh, I need like 20 more to live, I mean, a bare bones existence at that time. So I gave my notice at this job. I went home and two weeks later, I'm done that job. And in the next few weeks, I, I, there was no such thing as advertising or anything back then. 20 students appeared at the door. And wow. <laughs> divine intervention. Hey. Yeah. That, that was the beginning of my full-time professional career. Wow. So what was that? I mean, I, I can only imagine what it was like knowing that, you know, you've, you've backed yourself into a corner. Right. You know, <laughs> and realizing, hey, this... this this is not going to work. Something is going to have to shift. But then, you know, in the span of a couple of weeks, nearly doubling the enrollment at your dojo. Right. I mean, what, what was that feeling like? Well, um, I, I knew it had to be divine intervention because I didn't do anything to make it happen. And, you know, the word didn't get out in the community that this guy needs 20 students real fast. He's going to be folding up his tent. It just, I just, I never questioned it. I just said, well, I questioned in the sense that this is where I wanted to go. It was meant to be. <laughs> and uh, this is just another telltale sign that this is what I, I've been cut out to do in life. And uh, never look back. Never look back. Definitely had some rough right. years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that new Corvette was gone. <laughs> Along with a few other little material things. But yeah, I had a shift gears a little bit back back pedal a little bit there sure so maybe this was it but you know of course one of the questions we always like to talk about is how the martial arts has helped you overcome something of, of a challenge <laughs> well ironically martial arts put me in the deepest recesses of my life <laughs> um i started the House of the Samurai, my school in the basement of my home. And over the course of, I think I had 12 different locations. You know, we went to a VFW hall. We went to a community center. We're in a church basement. All little, you know, part-time ventures. Then we started hitting small storefronts. And then I moved the school to um, Londonderry, New Hampshire, where it's currently located. And, I, you know, it's like the Taj Mahal dojo down here as far as, you know, the hardwood floors ceiling to floor mirrors is gorgeous stunningly gorgeous i was able to build it from zero up to i got up to just under 400 students and uh, i've promoted 510 people to black belt over the years many have gone on to much higher ranks so but then i'm thinking futuristically i i, I can't carry this ball forever and i have an obligation to continue the rule of the system so I need to look for a successor of some sort. So uh, I had one of, one of my long-term students, um, a young lady that basically was running the school for me. So I sat down with her and said, okay, you now let's think futuristically here. Uh, maybe it's, you know, maybe uh, three years from now, we patch the 
I'll pass the torch and, you know, I'll still be on hand, but it'll be yeah, kind of your school at that point. So we agreed and, uh, wasn't too long thereafter. <laughs> she came to me and she said, well, I've decided I'm going to open up the next town over, which is, you know, part of my territory. And I'm going to take these 30, 40, 50, 60 students with me. And I'm going to take these 10 to 11, 12 black belts with me and good luck to you. And so that started a little downward cycle there. You know, it just broke my heart. Broke my heart. Well, I'm still thinking. I got to, you know, I have an obligation to pass on the rule of the system. So I had another, a young couple. They basically started with me um, uh, eight, nine, ten years old. And they met at the dojo. They ended up getting married. I was attended their wedding. They were my children. They were my children. And he was going off into the military. He said, I really want to have my own school. I said, all right, when you get back in five years, if you still have this aspiration, you know, this ambition, um, I'll make it happen. So five years went by. They came back. I ended up, well, they, you know, just getting out of the military. Didn't have any, much of anything. Uh, certainly no, uh, no money set aside to, to buy a school. So I made it happen. You know, I, I held paper. I, I just made it possible for them to get into their own school. And uh, I was willing to do it on a, a bow and a handshake. And I had a lot of legal advice and accounting. of oh, You can't do that. I said, I'm, what difference does it make? I said, it's either going to work or it isn't. And I said, so anyway, we did, we did the deal. And that deal went so sour, so fast. And this is the hot, but this is what put me down. Um, they uh, basically had made some alignments when they were in the military with other martial artists overseas. And it basically booted me to the curb to go with someone else. Threw me out of my own school, technically, but it wasn't mine at that point. And uh, they didn't follow my advice as they should have. And basically, they ran the school out of business. But before they did that, they took what? small remaining money there was and went right down the street and opened up under a different name. And they're still there. Uh, I'm sure they're struggling and not that I wish that upon them, but it's like, these are the closest people in my life. And they just put the knife deep in my back. So baby, it, they just, they stopped showing up here. Students were still showing up, but there were no lights on. They didn't even let their students know that they were moving down the road. Uh, you know, that reflected very badly upon me. And uh, it, it, I'm over it now, but uh, I tore my heart out, tore my heart out. And as a result of that type of, um, you know, the, the business side of things, uh, every penny I had been able to put aside for retirement as a result of when I was a police officer, insurance adjuster, I had to pay off the debt they had accumulated. And just uh, I lost everything. I lost everything. And then as a result, shortly thereafter, I lost an 18-year-old dog, her 15-year-old daughter. You know, I love animals. I lost my mom. I lost my dad. I lost the commercial building that the school was in as a result of all this. So I was as deep down as you possibly could get. So martial arts put me there. But then I just looked in the mirror one day and said, hey, I teach people how to overcome these type of obstacles. So I, it's about time I start to do, you know, walk, walk the walk. Cause I've been talking the talk long enough. So I just, was just, I woke up one day and just said, enough's enough. Now the school was closed at that point. Cause I had migrated to another, one of my other students. And I went down to a school in Salem, New Hampshire, National Karate Institute. And Kyoshi Yu, he's known with me over 30 years. So, so I was down there. And the Japanese have a saying, in, in every bit of bad, there is some good. You just got to find it. So I'm down there and doing my thing. And when I first walked into the school, I, I don't know what it is. Something's wrong here, but I don't know what it is. So I just kept doing my thing. I kind of took over and taught most of the classes. And uh, whatever feeling I got passed, and Mr. Hewitt came to me. He says, you know, he says, I was about two weeks short of going out of business when you came. He said, and now the school is thriving. So that's the good that came out of the bad. <laughs> and uh, so it did have a purpose, uh, and it came full cycle. 
Wow. That's, 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 some, <laughs> that's some powerful stuff. Now, I'm sure a lot of the listeners out there teach and, and some of them even have their own schools. So somewhere in here, you know what the secret sauce is because you, you've been able to, you know, you, you've seen the difference between you being in a school and you not being at a school. Right. What would you, what did you bring in in that two weeks that turned everything around? Well, I have a, I have a probably, well, definitely as a result of martial arts, but then my police background, I have a very acute sense of detail. Uh, you know, I try to show that when I do kata. I just have a very acute sense of the smallest little details, which, and I have another saying, everything counts. So if you, you take care of those little itty bitty details, they add up and turn into big details in your favor. I just, uh, there's just a lot of things that, you know, you'd, you'd just, you got to be looking for at times, but they're there. Uh, you, the facial expressions of the students, do they leave sweating and smiling or are they just leaving because they're glad to get out of here? And uh, I just, I, I shifted gears. I, I, I upped the level of training. Uh, there was definitely a lot more sweating going on. And maybe the, uh, the owner of that school just didn't have t too much bench strength. He never really developed instructors. He was teaching most of the classes himself and trying to spin a lot of different plates, all ranked classes. You got a raw beginner in with a fifth down or higher. You got to keep everyone moving and learning. And it can be challenging. It can be challenging. So I just put some systems in place that I had had in place here at the House of the Samurai that. Uh, had proven themselves over. How's the Samurai's been around now? Uh, Forty-two years. So, seen a lot of changes over those years, and uh, I just uh, I treated it like my own school. He gave me uh, free reign to do what I thought was necessary. So, a lot had to do with you know what's happening out on the dojo floor, but there was a lot of administrative things too. A lot of people kind of fell through the cracks. You know, not testing when they should have been testing, uh, things like that. And uh, students won't tell you about it a lot of times. They'll just leave. Sure. Sure. So if we had to boil that off to a, a, a nugget of wisdom, you, you would say pay attention to the details. Yes, pay attention to the tiniest of details. Stay on top of all of those things that you might think don't matter, but put your, you know, put yourself in the position of the student. Try to remember what it's like to be a white belt. You know, there's a high degree of dropout in a lot of schools in that, that first six months. And uh, just try to put yourself in their gi. Remember what it was to be there and what can you do to help them transition into the community on a long-term basis, black belt and beyond. Mm. Yeah, details, details, details. <laughs> Great. So, other than Mr. Martin, who would you say has been the most influential on your martial arts career? Well, I met a gentleman, um, happened to be a Goju stylist, so he, he was influential. Uh, Mr. Martin had to take a sabbatical because he, you know, he, he got married, uh, had a daughter. Had to get like a full time job to to pay for his uh, increasing commitments, so I was uh, I was without a teacher for a, a number of years on the Goju side, and that that led me to uh, start studying Shonru, but it also led me to to join a few organizations that uh, could help me on my journey. So I, I joined one organization, National Karate Jiu Jitsu Union, out of Valdosta, Georgia. And the chief instructor for that, it was a mixture of all different styles, but the chief instructor of that organization was a uh, Roger Wehrhorn, a Goju stylist out of Nutley, New Jersey. So we had that little Goju connection, and uh, he came up to visit me here once, and he had purchased a business system. There was no such thing as today. You got, you know, 
Maya, NAPMA, all these professional organizations. There was none of that back then. And he had purchased a business system. I believe he bought it from, uh, I want to say, Frank Hogrose from Virginia Beach, a Sean Roof stylist. And he says, all right, I got this business system. This is what my school is doing with it. Would you be interested in, uh, you know, purchasing it from me? And I was bumbling along. I still want to be, I was full-time professional, but <laughs> I was leave, living a meager existence. I said, well, how does it work? He said, well, we'll implement the system. And if, um, you know, say we predict you would do, say, $1,000 a month, and all of a sudden you're doing 2000 a month, he said, I get half of the, the overage, you keep, the other half, and it goes up to X amount of dollars. And before he finished speaking, another thing, okay, let's do it. I just, I was kind of desperate. <laughs> and uh, it immediately turned this school around and headed it upriver. Immediately. It just had to do with good business. Things that are like commonplace for the most part in today's martial arts world were unheard of back then. A lot, of, lot to do with, you know, pricing. Uh, asking for a commitment from the student, you know, in the form of uh, a contract, uh, these type of things. Uh, we delved into ranking systems and just a lot of stuff that tied into the, it was business matter, but it, it had an integral impact on the success of the school and the, the training. And, uh, you know, my, uh, I was very close to my parents and, when they heard that I, I bought this system, I'm just aware I'm not in New Jersey, kind of a fast paced environment, you know, and to be honest, they didn't, they didn't trust this gentleman. And uh, just, just for the fact he was a country-ish like we were, so to speak. And I say, hey, I got nothing to lose. I'm not doing anything at this point. The school is just bumbling along. I got nothing to lose. And it's only based on performance. So if it doesn't perform, I lose nothing. Uh, overnight it performed. And that was the turning point for the dojo. I went from, uh, I doubled my enrollment within, within six months. And that, that was, that was it right there. So, uh, yeah, he came in, he came into my life just as a result of joining that, that NKJU and, and, uh, yeah, he actually filled in some blanks in my Goju training along the way. So it was a good, it worked out well. Oh, great. So let's talk about competition. <laughs> of course, you actually come in to be honest. Yeah. Hey, that's competition is where I met you and, yeah, and how and, we began you our were, friendship. You were an integral part in me competing. All right. You don't know that, but I, I don't know that. <laughs> well, I did. I, you know, I, I really hadn't competed much over the years and I, I called it, I, I constantly referred to it as you get a monkey on your back hmm. and everyone's afraid of losing and, so I'm trying to teach people how to overcome this, and all of the time I'm I've got a family of silverback gorillas on my back, and I say you got to feed the monkey a peanut. If you don't feed it a peanut, it feeds off you in the form of it erodes your confidence. You got to test yourself under different conditions than are prevalent in the dojo. So uh, I had I had done a little competition. Uh, my biggest win was I won our school championship. And this is when Mr. Martin was uh, captain of the very first United States karate team. And some of my dojo mates were on that team and had, you know, returned after competing against uh, 30 different countries, returned successfully. And my, my big day of competition was our school tournament when I beat all them. It wasn't by much, but I ended so that was about the height of my competition. And then years and years and years and years go by. And um, I went to a tournament. I saw you, do, you You had that little push-up contest. And there was a lot of people over your booth at the time. And I steered clear. But I was thinking about it. So then uh, when it was a little quiet, I went over. And uh, I gave it a shot. And there was no one around the booth when I went down. And a minute later when I got up... There was a small crowd there because I put up like 72 in a minute that day. And yeah. the kind of the buzz went through the gym a little bit as, you know, look at the old dude, the old dude, <laughs> 67 years old. Look at how many he did. And I got a little taste of that. It just, it's just sat there a little bit. 
And I'm talking to Mr. Mana and I say, you know, I'm trying to get the students to compete. I said, my oh, it's like pulling teeth. He said, why don't you leap from the front? Why don't you do it? I said, ooh, sensei. It's been like decades. <laughs> he said, well, he said uh, what's there to lose? I said, well, you know, over the years I've gone up a lot in rank and it's a lot easier to just sit on the sidelines and have everyone think you're pretty good and then to get out there and prove that. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's going to be pretty uh, transparent at this point. So I said, well, you know, I've been, if I lead by the front, I'll get others to follow and, hey, suck it up and just do it. So um, the next tournament I entered and I happened to win my division and I happened to win the grand championship and that, that was it. And I committed to doing every tournament on Epo and Twin State and the Smart Circus last year. And I did that along with two other, two or three, a couple of little local tournaments around here. And I'm doing the same this year. So it was a direct result of one, I got a little taste of competition in your push up contest. And two, Mr. Martin encouraging me to, you know, get the monkey off your back. And I'm addicted <laughs> at this That's point. Great. That's great. You meet some great you- people and it's, Sure. Intense rivalry, but it's real healthy, and we help each other, and it's just been very rewarding. What would you say your favorite part of competition is? Well, I still get the pre-competition jitters the day or two before. <laughs> I don't like that part, but um, just the camaraderie. You know, you're competing with people of all different styles uh, before you go up. We pat each other on the back and wish the best of luck. And after you've done your form or what have you, it, it, it almost doesn't matter what the score is. It's just you're getting up there, you're representing your teacher, your dojo, your system, the arts, and uh, you're just doing your part to have others see what training will lead to. Not 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 so much on the physical, but the, the spirit that's underlying and the competitiveness, yet it's a healthy competition. And it really doesn't matter how it turns out. You put your best foot forward and that's it. This is a lot of variables totally out of your control. You know, sometimes the referees like what they see. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> and that's just, yeah. <laughs> and that's that just is the true. nature of the beast. And, you know, the worst thing, I, I just tell the students, I said, no matter what happens, you grin and bear it. You don't go complaining about the referees because I guarantee if you do this for a period of time, there's going to be some some trophies you take that you really didn't deserve for whatever reason. And until you're willing to give those back, <laughs> don't worry about the ones that you didn't get that you did deserve. It's irrelevant. Just go in with no expectations, give it your best shot, and that's it. Leave it at that. Yeah. Well said. Now, I know over the years you've had the chance to train with some amazing people. You've, you've mentioned some of those names now. But if you had the opportunity to train with someone that you haven't, who would that be? Well, I would definitely would have loved to be in Chojin Miyagi, the founder of Gojuru Karate Do's Backyard Dojo. Not so much wearing those loincloths looking geese, <laughs> I, would, I would definitely, it's an amazing system. It's a very, uh, it's organized. It's very systematic. There's a reason and the material is stacked upon each other in a very logical way. I, I would just like to have been there to see how he devised this, this unique system. Is what went into his thought processes to come up with the the end result. Uh, I've read a, I've read a lot about it, but I would you know I just like to have been there on the front line for one class just to get a feel for the origins of uh, of the art. Sure, sure, an excellent choice. Somebody I, I too would love to have studied with. Now, how about movies? Are you uh, you at all a movie guy? I am a movie like, guy. Uh, um, I've, I've seen a lot of martial art movies, and it's hard to pick a favorite one. But there's a couple that come to mind pretty quickly. That uh, they're about 
Muay Thai, and it's a Tony Ja. He's in the Protector and Unbok yeah. movies. That the, the, the technique is absolutely stunningly beautiful. But there's good story to both those movies. And I also like Only the Strong with Mark Dacascus. Mm, one of my favorites. In that movie, he does Brazilian capoeira, but originally he's a uh, kundo. That his his dad Al Dacascus and his mom Malaya Dacascus, I believe that was her name. Um, they were definitely first generation martial artists, and they were Mr. Martin competed against uh, with Al Dacascus. It goes back one generation earlier than mine. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. I, actually, I think he mentioned that when he was on the show. I don't. Not sure, but that, that that rings a bell. Cool. So, how about actors? Would is there anybody outside of Tony Jaw and Mark Dacascos, or would those be your? your I always had a in the early days, particularly in the earlier movies, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme. Uh, just uh, kind of grown fond of him over the years. Uh, watched probably all of his movies. Blood Sport definitely would be the one that comes to mind. <laughs> I just, uh, I just, I just, uh, <clears throat> he's, uh, has some serious training, obviously, and got some serious skills. And I, know, I just took a liking to, to his movies, along with a lot of others. <laughs> but, uh, when I was growing up, go ahead. Go ahead. Excuse me. When I was growing up in the 80s in the martial arts, of course, it was. Where, wherever you looked, it was Van Damme in a movie. Yep. I mean, just yep. constant. And he did so much. You know, not that I would say he was on the level of Bruce Lee in any way, but he was kind of the 80s equivalent right. of Bruce Lee. I mean, he was just there in so many movies for good and for bad, and maybe in hindsight more for bad than for, for good, <laughs> at least the quality of the movies. But they were fun. Yeah. And yeah. I have fond memories of, of Bloodsport and and so many others. I, I think I saw something uh, as I was putting together show notes for an episode of, a couple months ago that there was another kickboxer movie coming out this year that he was starring in. So he hasn't stopped. <laughs> so how, how about books? You mentioned that you've done some reading. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yagi, but I'm not much of a reader, read? and that goes back to that all boy high school I went to. Mm. Every summer we had to read seven books, and these went. The, one year they threw a little fish to us. They let us read John, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, a little itty bitty book that you could read in one sitting. But for the most part, it was like The Last of the Mohegans, David Copperfield, huge books, thousands of pages. I got a kind of out of the reading. <laughs> Uh, as a result, and basically the first day back each year when you returned to school after the summer, they, they gave you a, a book test, and you couldn't have cheated by reading a little crib notes where you had to have read that full book in order to pass that test. You didn't pass that test, you were done. You were gone. So wow. it was kind of force-fed. But uh, I read a book recently. It's actually written by well, a uh, Weichi stylist. Um, He's actually a competitor. Uh, he has a, a, a Weichi school uh, a couple of towns over. His name is Buzz Durkin. Uh, he runs a school uh, consistently, 350, 400 students. Tuition is about $225 a month. He's got the highest retention rate, I think, in the world. No one quits this school. No one. Wow. So he wrote a book. And it, you can sit down and read it in one sitting. It's called... The Martial Arts School Owner's Guide to Teaching, Business, and Life. And I've read it twice so far. I'm going to read it again. And I bought a copy for the uh, the seven seven schools within Shidokan. I bought a copy for each of the owners. And I said, there's something to be learned by reading this simple book. This gentleman has, and he teaches Weichi Karate, traditional school. There's only eight katas in the whole system. They don't do any extra, no, there's no upgrades, there's no black belt clubs or anything like this. It's just traditional karate training, as simple as simple can get, and no one quits that school. He's got the best retention, so I, and it's, it's a, I read it twice, like I said, and 
Uh, in fact, I shared it with some of the people on the, um, the circuit recently, talking about the, the business piece of martial arts. And I said, hey, I just read a book. you got to get it. So this last tournament, a couple of them said, hey, we read that book and we passed it on to some of our students. So, uh, uh, that, I never read anything more than once, but <laughs> I've been just sitting down and thought this on its third. It's just, um, what do you do to develop relationships with the students to hold on to them and the next generation, the next generation, you know, what do you do? There's got to be more than just the training. And uh, he relates that in, in his book. So the gold nuggets of information. I always knew he had the retention. I just didn't quite know how he achieved it. And he's very forthcoming in the book. This is how I did it. And uh, great, great information to have. And we've had that book mentioned a couple times. We've had that book mentioned on the show a couple times. And, of course, I'll link to it in the show notes for Ah. anyone that maybe isn't familiar with the way we do things. We have a website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and we have links to all the things that we talk about over there. So if anyone wants to make it easy, they can pop over there and just click the link from there. So we've talked about, you know, the reasons that you compete, but obviously there are other things that are keeping you going. You know, are there are there goals, things that you're you're looking out to accomplish over the next few years? Yeah, um, well, I have my my organization, Shitapan USA. Right now, there are seven schools. Um, I'm looking to recruit more schools into that organization, and basically, it's a uh, we've got a Taekwondo school, we've got Shonro schools, we have Goju schools, so it's style is almost irrelevant. Uh, basically, what I do is um, a lot to do on the business side that's included with the relationship as to um, things I've learned over the years. How can I, four of the schools are full-time professional schools, and they got to be that way as a result of instituting certain things that I had already instituted. And uh, basically, I, I credit curriculums, I license schools, I, I uh, instruct a licensure and certification, rank certification, and business development. That's basically what Shido Khan does. And uh, what I did, I've been a member of quite a few organizations over the years when, when Mr. Martin was on his sabbatical. Um, I, I had joined a number of different organizations. And so when it came to the creation of Shidokan, which I created with my Shonro instructor, Mr. Zem from Laconia, New Hampshire. I wrote down a list. Okay, I've been a member of all these organizations. What are the the bad points? What do I what do we not want where do we not want to go? And what were the good points? So we kind of listed both of those. And the bad points were like as long as my leg. <laughs> um and the good points were too few. So we, uh, we, we developed an organization that uh, invested interest in the school, not so much in the financial end, but if the school is more successful, the organization becomes more successful. And uh, you know, some of the, the organizations that I was part of just, they were making crazy demands. You know, uh, if you, I was a Goju stylist, but then I joined a uh, Shonru organization because I was a, you know, I, I started studying Shonru as well. And this is my full time profession. And one of the requirements was okay, we're going to come in and everyone puts on a white belt, start fresh. And you want me to go to a couple of hundred parents and tell them that their children who have been with me, you know, six, eight, ten years are no longer a six degree junior black belt they're, they're going to go back to white belt is that what you're saying <laughs> yeah that's it that's it i said there's not going to be Ugh. a school <laughs> we could be a member of your organization but there's not going to be a school here shortly that just doesn't make sense so certain things like that you know uh, just demands that were absolutely insane on the business side and none of these people were making their living doing professional martial arts as far as in the trenches of the dojo so uh that's how Shido Khan came to be. And, uh, yeah, right now we've got seven member schools. Always looking to 
to recruit new schools. Basically, if someone doesn't have a teacher, if they have no future access to rank, if they're interested in uh, teaching licensure, basically uh, we were licensed through the um, the uh, international organization, uh, the international organization of all Japan Karate Do Federation. I received an international licensure through them. So that kind of opened up the door for me to now be able to issue the same credentials through Shidokan. And uh, for someone, you know, for whatever reason, if you don't have a teacher now, if you had a teacher and, uh, well, I didn't get promoted, so I left, Shidokan is not interested in you. Uh, that, that's an <laughs> invalid reason. I've been there my. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Go back. Your teachers, your karate, your, you know, your martial arts dad. You just don't walk out on your dad. You get down, sit down at the table, hash out your differences, and you need to trust your teacher. Unless they've given you some absolute concrete reason not to. And those are few and far between from what I've seen out there. So yeah, if someone, um, you know, if their re- their teacher passed on, or their teacher retired, or they moved and have no further connection, they'd be a, a prime candidate for Shidokan. And, uh, okay. and the the website for that is is shidokanusa dot com, if I remember correctly. That's correct. Okay. All right. Great. And of course, we'll like everything else. We're going to link that. Best way to reach me would be via that uh, the email, Hanshi at ShidokanUSA.com. Okay. Okay. And yeah, when I when I get involved with the school, like I say, it's, it's their school. I make suggestions. I make recommendations. I give reasons why I would do certain things, and um, I leave it there. You know, it's their decision. There's no mandates. Um, it's up to them. And I, you know, I, I, sure. I'll be a little bit more. Try to be a little more convincing when it's a, a key piece. And I tell them, from what I know, you can't get there from here if you don't do this. And I, just, <laughs> and I give them all the facts and figures to back it up. And then it's up to them. It's up to them. Uh, make recommendations. And uh, when they see the, the House of the Samurai, you know, this kind of the, the end result of all these things I talk about. I say, okay, this is what I created. I was started in the basement of my home. And, here you have the Taj Mahal Dojo. And, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, the, the school actually closed. And uh, Kyoshi Gimakali, who who you know, um, mm-hmm. he had been coming down here annually. He just walked in my school one day. And his, his now wife, Rebecca, they walked in and they said, uh, we heard you have a tournament. Would you mind if Rebecca competed? I said, you traditional, it's a traditional tournament by invitation only. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So she competed and I said, wow, she's pretty good. So he said, um, well, he, had, he had been living in Fairbanks, Alaska. And uh, they came back every year to visit Rebecca's parents who live in Nashville, New Hampshire. So uh, they, they kind of shaped their annual visit to coincide with my tournament. So he said, can I compete next year? I said, absolutely. But when I saw him compete, I said, oh, my God. <laughs> you see him. Oh, yeah. God. He's exceptional. <laughs> so uh, he he kept coming back year after year, and he, he's won my tournament, I think, 11 years in a row now. So I think it was you know, four or five years ago he came back. He said, well, let's go over the dojo. Well, my tournament was in May, and they uh, kind of walked out in April. So I said, well, the dojo is there, but there's no one there. As far as students, I said, technically out of business, at least for the moment. And I said, I've migrated to a school in Salem, and I'm, you know, I'm, I've been able to turn that school around. I'm kind of happy there. I said, but I said, now, from the moment I met you, you said you always wanted your own school. I said, you're in Fairbanks, Alaska, and you, you also talked about returning to this area to be closer to your, you know, in-laws. I said, I'll tell you what, if you're willing to migrate back here, you know, you and your wife and your son, I said, I'll reopen that school. I'll get get it going with you and I'll give it to you. And that's exactly what happened. 
he uh, about five years ago he he came back. We started with zero students, and now you're starting to see um, some of his students on the circuit. And obviously they're they're fairly skilled. And uh, yeah, but you came down to now the vested interest. They remember Shido Khan, so I have a vested interest on that on that aspect. Uh, but it's his school, and I I gave it to him. And because uh, I just saw something in him, people opened up some doors for me. A few shut doors on me, but uh, I just saw something in him that you know, it, he's the real deal. And uh, trying to pay it forward a little bit. And that's where the House of the Samurai has come back into its glorious existence, as, as through Kiyoshi Dimakali and his wife Rebecca. Oh, great. And and Kiyoshi's a, a, a great person. I've had really enjoyed the conversations that I've had with him and, and hope to spend some more time with him in the future, for sure. And I really appreciate everything that you've given us here today, and, and thank you for your time. And I'm hoping maybe you have some parting advice, not that you haven't given us all a ton already in the last hour or so, but uh, any words of wisdom you want to leave on? Well, on my, uh, I give out medals at my tournament, and on the back... Of the medal are the virtues of the samurai, which are integrity, respect, courage, honor, compassion, honesty, and loyalty. And I would encourage all those involved in the martial arts, particularly those teaching the martial arts, you can't kind of pick and choose. (laughs) You need to have all of those seven virtues to teach this art appropriately. It's one thing to talk the talk, but you need to walk the walk, and you need to have the. You got to be a shining example in in those areas. Uh, I've just seen so many over the years that some of them, almost all of them, but they're missing. We'll say loyalty. Well, that's a big piece. <laughs> uh, they're missing respect. Yeah, you need it all. You need it all. Um, and I would highly encourage you. If you don't have that skill set, develop it. And move forward and try to put forth the most professional image because we we save lives. This is not about punching and kicking and blocking. It, yes, it is, but uh, we develop character. We save lives, literally save some lives. Um, you need to uh, treat it appropriately. It's a very important integral part of society. That's what I would encourage. Thank you for listening to episode 64 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Hanchi Bernard for your time. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes with links to Hanchi's organization, a few photos, and that quiz I mentioned during the intro. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out on a new episode. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, we'd appreciate it. Remember, if we read yours on the air, just email us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our line of polyester no-sweat t-shirts. They're one of our best-selling clothing items and definitely worth a look. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.